Thank you. Uh, could we just have the PowerPoint, if possible? Um, so I remember when I uh, did my postdoctoral research in uh, Jingmao Taishui, UIB now, and the former Mofcom University. It was in 2003, and China just joined the WTO. Everybody was looking at the issue on how to penetrate the Chinese market, how fast China would liberalize, how fast it would enforce new intellectual property rights. Uh, but the perception that was mostly that it was about China being an opening market, but not about China having multinational cooperation capable of challenging the most uh, competitive EU US or Japanese firms. And I like to remind this because today uh, people have a very short memory and they are, seem to be realizing that the Chinese government has successfully developed an industrial policy to develop national champions that are now challenging even in top technologies like Huawei and the 5G, uh, the most advanced uh, firms in Europe and the US. And if you look at the number of firms in the top 500 firms of the world, in 1995 there were only three, and now there's over 100. They're just ranking second behind the United States, while Germany and France have 29. So this is to tell you that the perspective has radically changed. In Europe, it has been changing a lot since 2008, which has shown the fragility of Europe, but also the incapacity of Europe to solve the lack of investment in the southern part of the EU and in the eastern part of the EU. And this lack of investment has created a vacuum in which, of course, other players moved in, and notably China, but as we've seen, this week we learned that the Russian Development Bank is moving to Hungary, so uh, this is also uh, a state which was characterized by a lack of investment. And indeed, the EU after 2008 had a lot of difficulty maintaining internal cohesion and an economic balanced development between its member states. And I think that the initiative 16 plus 1 thrown by China took advantage of this lack of investment and interest by the Western member states to the difficult situation of the Eastern member state. Uh, so I would say that in the EU, of course, we've been more worried about Chinese penetration since 2014, because although Chinese multinationals had been starting to develop after 2002, 2003, after 2008, there was an acceleration of Chinese uh, ODI, outward direct investment. But in Europe, there was a brutal acceleration in 2014, 2015, and suddenly major technological companies, major big traditional brands like Volvo, that was already in 2010, but then Pirelli, and then we had, of course, KUKA, the electronic firms from Germany, that began to create a new worrying feeling in the EU capitals that China would take away strategic assets, bring back the technology to China, and begin to compete, uh, trying to launch their own industrial policy with their developing their own innovation capacity and progressively challenging the EU companies, not only on the Chinese market, but even within the EU. Now, at the same time, a new initiative was developed, the BRI, well, at, what, at the beginning, OBOR, One Belt, One Road, in 2013. And I'd like to come back a bit to try to explain the general context of BRI, because a lot of people see it coming from out of the sky. Uh, some of them said it was a way to solve overcapacity in the Chinese economy after the slowdown of the Chinese economy in 2012. And that's certainly a part of the motivation for BRI. But I don't think it's the main issue. And the main issue is about global trading governance and different methods, how to organize this global trading governance. You have first to recall when BRI was made, 
and you see here, of course, the extent of this project, which is mostly about infrastructure and developing export platform and connectivity. So it's a different way to foster trade than, I would say, the EU traditional method, which is to develop new generation trade agreement based on WTO plus commitment with a kind of legally binding agreements like the US on, for example, intellectual property, procurements, uh, uh, tr trade-related investment measures, and so on. First, what was the global context in BRI? Well, of course, you had a trade slowdown, but that was only really after 2014, so after the launch of the BRI. But you had, since 2000, a stalemate in trade liberalization. The Doha Development Agenda, the DDA, did not work. Uh, it did not work because there were dissension between the US and Europe and India about agriculture. But it did not work as well because there was a major issue between the large emerging economies on one side and the EU, the US, and Japan on the other. Since 1996, at the WTO Singapore conference, there were the so-called Singapore issues that were raised by the most advanced economies on intellectual property rights development, on access to procurement, on trade facilitation, and on having principle of, I would say, competition rules at the multilateral level. This was a non-starter for, non for the large emerging economies. Countries like Brazil, India, and behind them China, were not ready to give up state protection of their national champion and wanted to pursue uh, autonomously their own industrial policy of creating national champion using precisely monopoly, like China Mobile can have, using subsidiary subsidies that distort competition to promote national champion and internationalization of business. They also wanted to use, of course, large procurement uh, and use their size, which is what small developing countries cannot expect to do. But a country like Brazil, Embraer, the big success of Brazil, although now it's facing difficulty and, and getting closer to Boeing, but if you look at Embraer, the, air pay, the airplane producer of Brazil, it was mainly built through state procurements and to a kind of monopoly on the Brazilian market for airplanes at the beginning and with state intervention. And in that sense, India, Brazil, and China, and Russia, when it joined the WTO later, are still pursuing this model. They're opposed to the Singapore issues that actually the US, Europe, and Japan still try to impose. This stalemate at the WTO level led to what Robert Zelik, the US trade representative of the time, used to call competitive liberalization. So the big powers went for bilateral agreements, WTO plus, including most of the Singapore issues in these bilateral agreements. That was the goal. The U.S. started to develop about 40 of them during that decade with CAFTA. And you can mention, of course, you know, Singapore, South Korea, Jordan, Morocco, and so on. The EU followed with the global strategy of Peter Mendelssohn, who was Commissioner for Trade, who also advocated to have large bilateral agreements, and of course Japan has its own economic partnership agreement in the Pacific and in the Americas. So this competitive liberalization developed a lot of bilateral agreement, but weakened the WTO as an institution and there were a lot of bilaterals, FPAs and FTAs and APAs. But what happened is that after the crisis of 2008, the U.S. became concerned about the rise of emerging economies and especially China influence in trade, finance and technological standard. It became much more worried in ICT and telecom, seeing that China was trying to develop its own Google was trying to go into the 5Gs and trying to develop global standards, which was a challenge that even the EU was not providing. 
The EU never challenged Google. They use competition policy to find Google, but they're not trying to create really an EU Google, or they have not managed to do so. In terms of digital champion, EU is quite dominated by the GAFA. China doesn't want that, and the Chinese Communist Party certainly does not want that for strategic and national sovereignty reason. So the U.S. became more concerned, became also more worried about Chinese takeover in the U.S., and the U.S. Congress tried to block more Chinese firms moving into the United States. So if you look at figures, China became, of course, at that time, the major trade power, more than the U.S., and if you look at the, since the 2008 crisis, you see the very fast rise of China while looking at the relative decline of the United States and the European Union, and you can see China in yellow here. And when people talk about emerging economies, the only real game changer is China. I mean, if you look at India, or if you look at the next 11 emerging economies, they're far less influential in terms of rise than China has been since the 2008 crisis. This is why, of course, all the center of attention turns on China. And if we look at, these are the forecasts from the CP, the, the most influential think tank on trade policy in France, uh, they've made a, an attempt to uh, picture uh, the world in 2050, showing that China would account for 25% of the world GDP, while the EU, with Britain in it, so that's not actually accurate, uh, probably, we're not sure yet, second referendum maybe, but uh, with only 16% and the US 19%. So India and China would actually be as big as the European Union and, and uh, the, U the USA. It was also at that time that people realized that most of the GDP in the world would be totally located in Asia that the big rise was to be the Asian market. And it's that in this context that the US government decided to shift towards Asia, the so-called US Pacific Century. It was already announced by Brzezinski analyst on the great chessboard. Then we've seen, of course, George Bush having a more assertive vision of China moving from strategic partner to the term strategic competitor, but it was really Obama who realized the so-called Asian pivot. And of course, you can see clearly in the article wrote by Hillary Clinton in Foreign Policy, the goal of the US. I quote Hillary Clinton, open market in Asia provide the United States with unprecedented opportunities for investment, trade, and access to cutting edge technology. Our economic recovery at home, post-2008, huh, will uh, depend on the export and the ability of American firms to tap into the vast and growing consumer base of Asia. So you can see, and of course it is saying it is in increasingly crucial to global progress, whether through defending freedom of navigation in South China Sea, clearly targeting China, countering nuclear proliferation effort of North Korea, and ensuring transparency in the military activities of the region key players, again targeting China. And of course, with this Asian pivot strategy, the Obama administration launched two big negotiations. In 2012, with the State of the Union, Obama declared the opening of the TTIP negotiation, the transatlantic agreement. And then it pressured Japan into joining the TPP, the Trans-Pacific one. If you look at these two initiatives, TTIP and TPP, they actually have a common thing is that they exclude India, China, Brazil, and, China, uh, and Russia from the negotiation. So the big large emerging economies are not welcome in these two big projects that are actually most, I would say, uh, created by the will of the U.S. administration. And of course, the idea is also to promote U.S. technological standards and to transform them into global standards. And this was not hidden, it was explicitly mentioned by the negotiator, and here I can quote Carol de Gucht, the EU Trade Commissioner, 
the EU Trade Commissioner at the time of the TTIP negotiation, talking about the TTIP, he said, perhaps the biggest value of an agreement will be in our relation with the rest of the world. Why? Because the EU and the US are the world's largest market and the most influential regulators. Any common approach will double that influence. It may shape regulation around the world, including in countries like Brazil, India, China, and Russia, where today standards are typically much lower than in the US and in the EU. So clearly here, we have an attempt to create Western standards, and particularly technological and economic and legal standards, that would impose themselves with these two common big agreements that the bilateral agreements had not managed to do yet. And it was just a few months later that Xi Jinping, as a response, announced the One Belt, One Road initiative. I mean, if we look at this, in China, just at that time, a famous strategist, Professor Wang Jizi, begin to mention the fact that it could be a useful strategy to go west to escape the U.S. pivot and to reduce the Malacca Strait dilemma, that is, to reduce the dependency on the access to Singapore to have a different source for energy coming to China. It would be also a goal, of course, to integrate better China Western province and possibly to solve the tension in Xinjiang which I doubt very much that the Chinese government is do, right now doing with the current repression policies, and to ensure market access to Europe by non-institutional means. That is, the idea of BRI is different, of course, from TTIP and TPP. The Chinese government cannot totally open the economy and reduce the state intervention as the so-called TTIP is mentioning. There is no way that the Chinese government would accept an investor state dispute settlement, for example, like we had in the TTIP negotiation, or that it would open to procurement, like it has been discussed in the Japanese EU trade agreement. So China cannot really offer what we call the new generation trade agreement because it still wants to use the tools for developing its own national industrial policy. And for that, the goal of China, therefore, is actually to promote other types of non-legal liberalization, a de facto economic integration by providing infrastructure and different export capacity. And finally, probably at the beginning of the initiative, it was also sold by the Chinese leadership as a way to solve the problem of overcapacity in China. But if we look actually at the figures for the steel industry, uh, this is not going to make it. Uh, it's a very small percentage of the overcapacities in China. It can be, have a marginal effect, but certainly not the main effect. So I would say BRI is actually a response to the, um, I would say, the, the U.S. policy of trying to develop the U.S. Pacific century. And if you look at it, it's clear that the geographical scope of BRI is actually everything away from TPP and TTIP to take the remaining lot, that is to create a Eurasian integrated, economically integrated area not with the rule based, but actually by lowering transport cost. Because like that, of course, you can offset the tariff and the non-tariff buyers by improving the infrastructure. And of course, why was it so easy for the Chinese to actually play on division in the EU? It was very logical. I mean, people tend to forget that, but uh, when they just made the enlargement towards the Mediterranean in the 1980s, uh, and then with Eastern Europe in 2004 and 2007, the vision is that market forces alone would create a kind of economic convergence among member states. There were a lot of economic theories that shows that it was not really very likely, notably Krugman, uh, geographic uh, economy, 
show that even if you have better legal integration, that will not automatically lead to convergence because you have the phenomena of external economies of scale, business cluster in high tech that remains in some geographical area. Cluster of high technology do not scatter around the EU. Silicon Valley or Route 128 in the US are not in the middle of Alabama or they're not in the middle of South Dakota. And the same is true for the EU. There is no high-tech cluster in Romania, in Latvia, in Greece, or in Portugal. They are all located in the Northwest member states, which create more added value, and which are capable of moving towards a knowledge-based society and actually face Chinese competition. But on the other side, the peripheral member states of the EU are facing fully the competition from emerging economies because they are low-tech and their comparative advantage is on cheap labor. And there's other countries, member states, who are doing, there's other countries than the EU who are specialized into low cost based on low wages. Turkey, Morocco, India, Bangladesh. So I think it's going to be the technological divide has been extremely clear after the 2008 crisis. There was a lack of investment and the Juncker plan of investment to reduce the investment gap proved to be a failure. It was not technically a total failure in the sense that there were some creation of investment brought by the commitment of the EU public investment, some private investment developed, but mostly in the most advanced EU member states. So if we look at the Juncker initiative, it benefited a lot, Belgium, Scandinavia, Germany, but not so much Greece, Portugal, or Latvia. And so you begin to have a lack of investment problem. These countries of Eastern and Southern Europe faced very tough austerity, which led to a weakening of their government. And you can see that in Spain, in Greece, in Romania, in Hungary. Uh, I don't think Orban is a strong government. It's actually the authoritarian methods he used shows that it's actually the public government in Hungary is getting weaker and weaker and more corrupt and more actually controlled by foreign forces. And this is mostly because the northwestern state thought it was going to be solved. So I'd just like to show you, if I've got five minutes, okay. I'd like to show you, you recognize this of course, I took in Beijing, huh? the nice uh, fog that we know, you recognize of course this vision. Europeans, and I show that to my students, are always shocked when I show them this. Is that Beijing? No, that's Warsaw in Poland. And where is this? That's Bulgaria. And if I look at WHO, World Health Organization, the world deadliest countries by air pollution, Oh, ranking second is Bulgaria, an EU member state, and then we have Latvia, and we have Hungary, and we have Lithuania, and we have Romania, and we have Poland, and Croatia, which are, half of them are actually killing more people per hundreds of thousands of people than China. That's WHO statistics, huh? that's not, so it means that within the EU, we have countries who have such a low level of investment in infrastructure that they are using very polluting technology like the Chinese backward provinces. And that's within the EU whose GDP per capita is three times higher than China on average. So we are talking about, you know, green Europe and we have young students coming in the streets, but actually there is not enough transfer going from the most advanced parts of Europe to the less remote to try to improve the infrastructure. The Chinese government or even the US are more efficient than that and that's because of course we have a limited EU budget, 1% of the GDP, and this is 20 times less than the federal budget or the capacity of China to redistribute to provinces. So in this vacuum, it is not surprising that the 16 plus 1 initiative that China developed toward Eastern Europe has been quite successful, and it's not surprising that Mr. Salvini is accepting to, you know, promote BRI in Italy. Italy has one of the worst investment records in Western Europe.
and therefore any money is welcome, including the China's BRI project. I'd like to show you also why, of course, the Eastern European member states and the Southern will face a lot of problems. You can see here the figures in R&D between 1996 and 2013, uh, the amount of GDP spent on R&D. You can see the fantastic progress by China, who used to be at the level of Romania, a bit below, and that managed to reach the EU level. The EU average is 2%. China is at 2% now. China now spends proportionally more on research than Italy, far more than Italy, far more than Romania or Latvia. And if we look at R&D spending in current euro, the situation is even worse because as some countries have faced a recession, the amount of money spent in R&D in current euros are actually going down for a lot of member states from the periphery like Hungary, Portugal, Latvia, Greece, Estonia. So this means that within the EU there is a rising technological divide. Again, we can see here China having two universities in the top 100, seven in the top 300. We can see that Sweden is doing fantastically well with 10 million people. Germany is doing quite well, but then you can see Italy doing worse than China. And when you know where Italy came from, it's, it's a real strong decline. And you can see that for Poland, Romania, and Greece, there is simply no university in the top 300 for these member states, which means that these countries are actually low-tech compared to China. So this is why also there is a new complementarity the 5G debate is totally different if you take the perspective of Sweden and Germany than if you take the perspective of Romania, Italy or Greece because they have no national producer in these new ICT sectors and they have a different approach from those who are more the high-tech members. Now, something also to, to remind is some of the, the basic figures for BRI, because you have to quantify that a bit. I mean, BRI countries is about 30% of the world GDP this year. It's, you know, one trillion that has been pledged by the Chinese government over 36 years. So we are talking, if you really look at it, people talk usually of a Marshall Plan, but if I use the combined GDP of all the 65 countries that will benefit from BRI projects, uh, and if I put that on a 36-year period, that means that it will account for 0.82% of the GDP of this area. The, the Marshall Plan was 2% of GDP, so it's actually substantial, but far less important and it's also on a much longer period than the Marshall Plan. And if we look at some of the EU funds for Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, they are actually much greater than what BRI can provide to these member states. So if I'm looking just at uh, structural funds, the European Investment Bank, the Bird Bank, they can actually uh, provide 10 times more funds than BRI can do. But Marginally, because we're talking about weak EU member states who are into financial difficulty and a lack of investment, they would welcome any additional source, knowing that they can rely on the EU funds anyway and that they can just improve their infrastructure capacity by accepting the Chinese plan. So I would say that this is one of the, the reasons of, um, of, I would say, the, the success of BRI penetrating Europe and the worries that you have in Europe on this issue. I would simply finish, because I could go on. I had a lot of slides, but I won't have time to present them here. But I, I would just like to, to finish on uh, a note, is that First, I don't think we should expect a great opening of the Chinese market and a break away towards more liberalization. I think that the Chinese government will pursue its industrial policy, 
to promote national champions, to promote technology autonomy, to have their own 5Gs, their own GPS system, their own artificial intelligence standards, and they cannot rely on the U.S. as the EU has done, because the EU is mostly has for the moment two choices, U.S. technology or Chinese technology for 5G and, and artificial intelligence, because there is no real digital champions in Europe. If you take the top 40 firms in the world in ICT, there's only two European, SAP, German, and Schneider Electronics, French, but they're ranking 38 and 39 in the top 40. All the others are American, Chinese, or Japanese, and Taiwan, well, Chinese. So this is a major concern that you have, is that I think that Europe could open some sectors of the Chinese economy, maybe more finance, maybe some aspects in the real estate, maybe uh, some, uh, some procurements, but on key technology, on technological standards, on procurements, on strategic technology, the Chinese are not going to open because it's a very resilient, consistent strategy. They've been followed for two, cent two decades, and they are not yet, they have not yet catch up the U.S. and Europe. They're still lagging behind. They have some very great advance, like the 5G, but in many sectors, if they are buying so many European companies, it's because they're lagging behind. They're trying to take over KUKA because they don't know to make robots like the Germans still. They are learning. This is why they still need a national industrial policy. And so I don't expect big change from the Chinese in that policy. Nevertheless, I think a major problem in Europe is that Europe could actually complement better the Chinese by moving ahead in technology. A country like Sweden doesn't have a problem with BRI or even with Chinese takeover in Europe because Sweden spends so much in research and development that they can find advanced high-tech niche that they can sell to the Chinese. The problem, I think, in Europe is that not every member state is like Sweden. Italy is not like Sweden, and Portugal is not like Sweden, and Romania is not like Sweden. So the periphery of Europe will have a hard time. And this is because there is no real consistent EU policy in research and EU policy to help the countries lagging behind in terms of technology. And the second big difference is that you have no EU industrial high-tech policy. Last week, we have seen, in the, in the last weeks, we've seen initiative by Le Maire and by Altmaier to discuss about creating a European industrial policy, trying to reduce competition policy and promote the capacity of create European champion with the Alstom and Siemens merger case to fight Chinese competition, but at the same time, Haltmeyer, recognizing the need of industrial policy, said we need a new DARPA. DARPA was the U.S. agency who promoted high-tech in the U.S. and who created the Internet, because the Internet was created by the U.S. Army. It was a U.S. industrial policy, and most of Silicon Valley was made through military contracts. So the business cluster of Silicon Valley was actually a state-led initiative. And Haltmeier was recognizing that. But at the same time, Haltmeier was not saying, we need a European DARPA. He said, we need a German one. Too bad for Romania and Italy and Portugal. So I think this is still a major concern. Europe doesn't spend enough on R&D to face the Chinese competition and the U.S. competition on the other side. And of course, Europe is not united and doesn't have big high-tech business cluster because of that. Thank you for your attention.